Welcome to Slack App Security, defending your workspaces from a bot uprising. First and foremost, we would like to acknowledge that Slack has recently changed our logo. You might have feelings, you might have opinions. We're not gonna go there today. We do have cool Slack security stickers on that chair up there that you can grab while you can because they will soon be vintage. Uh, also, let's just take a brief moment of silence to honor that whimsical joy that that gingham hashtag has brought to the world. Cool, okay, thank you, next. Uh, who am I? I'm Kelly. I'm a previous pen tester. I'm currently a product security engineer at Slack. I'm a former eco-pirate. I lived on Sea Shepherd ships for four years, for those of you who know what that is. Uh, I've battled poachers in Antarctica, and you can see that in this photo. Like, you can tell I'm in Antarctica because I'm wearing this Mustang suit and this funny hat, so like, why else would I be wearing this? Um, one of my proudest life's accomplishments was crafting a media strategy that forced the prime minister of a nation state to hold a press conference denouncing whaling, and he looked totally miserable to do it. So just so we're clear, like making the head of a nation state do literally anything is like the biggest flex, and I've peaked in life, and I know that. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs> wow, tough one to follow. <laughs> uh, I'm Nikki, I am also a former pen tester, and I also work at Slack, so I have a lot in common with Kelly. Uh, some key differences about me, um, I'm a tech lead manager on product security at Slack. I used to program, program mainframes before I got into security. Um, I have never been a pirate, don't have any plans to become a pirate, um, except in the software sense, I don't do that anymore. Um, and I really like to run, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about running today, I'm gonna talk about some other stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk to you about Slack, the platform, what Slack is. Some of you probably already a little bit know that. Uh, we're going to talk about the Slack app directory and what it is and isn't like and how that impacts security of apps in the directory. We're going to tell you some of what we've tried in terms of securing those apps so far and why it's not perfect yet. And then we're going to talk about some things we're going to try in the future. I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly for that. Cool. OK, so some of you may be asking, like, what is the Slack platform? Like, isn't Slack an app? Why would Slack have apps? That doesn't make sense. So let me start simple. How many of you use Slack? Yeah. So a lot. How many of you use apps in Slack as part of your regular work? So yeah, like most of you. So sorry if this is redundant, but I, I will just try to make this make sense for everyone so they can understand. Um, the mission that you have all heard is that we want to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And so while everyone in your company might be using Slack as the primary tool that connects all of your people and all of your projects, the tools that you use as individuals can vary greatly to get your job done. So some of us rely really heavily on GitHub. For other people, Zendesk is like the most crucial part of their workday. For a lot of us, it's Jira, which whether we would like it to be or not, and Salesforce. Uh, so we use Slack to accomplish whatever grand task we've set up, out upon through communication. And typically our work is fragmented and siloed across this, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not moving the slides. <laughs> Whoops. So <laughs> typically our work is fragmented and siloed across all of these different software, apps, browser windows with a bazillion tabs open, email chains that go on literally forever, and services. And there are thousands of tools that all enable us to do our jobs. So on average, companies have 1,400 different cloud services running within their org. And that's where the Slack platform comes in to streamline and centralize that work. So we have this really easy to build with set of APIs and developer guidelines. So anyone can build a Slack app. Like it's super easy. And some of you may have done it. Actually, have any of you done it? Have any of you built Slack apps? Yeah. Cool, yeah, it's, it's easy, it's fun. Uh, so you can connect those tools with your team's conversations. And, the platform takes these like high frequency, low effort work that happens dozens of times a day and automates it. So things like security alerts, checking your calendar when you don't remember what room your meeting's in, uh, the output of security tools, like if a PR fails a security test, and it pulls them into Slack where the team's working together. So yeah, the, the platform takes like, you know, makes Slack this awesome place to work because it kind of centralizes all of these things. And, Slack becomes this command center tailored to your workday. And so kind of in this analogy, you can think of the Slack platform as this really cool tool belt where you've got like hammer loops and cool pockets and carabiner rings to like hang stuff off of. Like 
everything that you use to get your job done can be brought in there. So back to Nikki. What is the Slack app directory? I'm so glad you asked what the Slack app directory is. <laughs> the app directory is where you get your apps, um, but that's pretty obvious. Um, to tie it back into what Kelly just said and say it a little more eloquently with a metaphor, um, if Slack is like your tool belt that you're hanging your hammers and your saws and your whatnots on, I don't know if you put a saw on a tool belt, but never mind that. It's fine. Um, it's fine. If Slack is the tool belt, uh, the Slack app directory is the hardware store where you go to buy those tools. Um, almost every major SaaS company has a Slack app today. So we've got your Dropbox, we've got your Google Drive, we've got your GitHub. All of those things obviously are in the app directory. Um, but a lot of our customers also rely on what we call Slack-first apps, which are apps that were actually written around Slack functionality. Um, so if any of you use like Poly, for instance, or SimplePoll, those were added to augment Slack functionality. And we have to support those developers too, who are often one or two people working together to write a Slack app. And our directory houses all those things. So a little more about the apps that end up in the directory. So every app that ends up in the app directory gets vetted by Slack to a certain extent. We actually have a team that's focused entirely on doing this. It's three people. Amy, Jake, and Marcelo. If you've ever submitted a, an app to the directory, you've probably spoken to one or more of them. Super great people. Um, and they're tasked with making sure that not only do those apps work and do the thing that they say they're supposed to do, but also that they work well. Um, we really optimize to get our highest quality apps in the app directory. And part of why we're able to have this focus on quality is that we don't make money off of the app directory, not directly anyhow. Um, we don't charge for apps, we don't plan ever to, and so we have no incentive to like let people shovel in apps that suck or that are full of security holes. Um, a lot of times the apps that are in the app directory are the result of some collaboration between us and de developers, which is great. Um, like I said, if you submit an app, you probably have a back and forth with Amy's team. Uh, we also sometimes uh, help people write apps, and then we have this great middle ground where we provide SDKs and doc for people who are trying to write apps. Um, and one more point of clarity here, we're only talking about distributed apps in the app directory in this talk. If you're familiar with internal integrations, which is like something your coworker wrote that you use just at your company, those are out of scope for this talk. So what is the app directory like? Um, the most obvious thing that I think of anyway when I think of the Slack app directory is, oh, it's just like the iOS store um, or Google Play. Spoilers, it's not, or I wouldn't be telling you about this. Um, it's similar in the sense that third-party developers write the app and ship them to us, but there are a lot of key differences too. Um, so we don't do re-review on new versions, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, unlike Android and iOS. And also Google and Apple are both much more mature companies than Slack is. Slack is about to turn five. Um, and not only are we sort of earlier on the maturity curve, um, those companies are, they have more money than we do and can place more stringent requirements on their developers. They also have better automated tooling than we do because again, they had more time. So Slack apps, app directory, not that much like mobile stores. App Directory is also similar in some ways to Chrome extensions, but our situation is maybe not quite as bad as a Chrome extension. Um, any rando can write a Chrome extension and any rando can write and submit a Slack app. Um, and the good thing about our App Directory is that those apps get vetted by a human. Um, Chrome extensions can change any time. Slack apps can also change any time, but sometimes we know when they change, so that's good. Uh, one thing that is a little more complicated about our model than securing Chrome extensions, though, is that Chrome extensions usually do like one thing, and that thing's kind of isolated. Like maybe you have an extension that's for changing headers and requests, and that's what it does, and the whole scope of risk there is that extension. Slack apps almost always tie back to a web app. Um, so like if you're using something like Evernote's Slack app, you're looking at some small piece of the Evernote functionality that's provided through Slack, 
And then there's this huge web app backing it. Um, so if you think about the total risk to a customer of ours, if we say, hey, install the Evernote app, um, we're not just saying think about the risk in the app. You also have to think about that uh, larger attack service of the backing web app. Finally, the last thing that this is sort of like is the HipChat store. It's very like the HipChat store, with the difference being, as I mentioned before, um, it's a directory and not a store. We don't make money off of that. And that lets us treat security a little bit differently. Um, so just a sort of recap of a couple of things that make it different and maybe a little more challenging to secure. Uh, we don't get source code from developers. Uh, we never see what the app is actually doing. We only see what it seems to be doing, which as security people we all know is a key difference. Um, we don't see version changes, typically. The one exception to that is that if the app changes the scopes that it requests on installation, then it has to go through re-review. Re so similar to like an Android app, uh, when you install a Slack app, it's going to ask the user, is it okay if I do things like get your channel history, um, send DMs as you, et cetera. If the set of scopes that an app is requesting changes, if they want to add something new, um, then that triggers a re-review by our process. But otherwise, stuff just changes and we don't know about it. Um, so that's cool. Um, there's also often this extensive backing app, like I mentioned, a very wide range of app developers, ranging from literally the biggest companies to literally one person. Um, and we don't really own the risk here, but it feels like we do. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit more and talk about the perception of risk in Slack apps. So I will note that this slide is entirely my opinion and not the view of my employer. Um, there's a big pile of risk with Slack apps, and it's actually not super clear who that risk lies with. As security people, we're looking at it and we're going like, oh, some third party is writing this. It's a service they maintain. We have no visibility into it. The risk belongs to them. Um, and it would be super great to stop it there, except as a user coming into the Slack ecosystem, going into the app directory, I think there's a very real and very reasonable expectation that apps that appear in our directory are endorsed by us. Um, and so if, whether we have a legal commitment to make sure those apps are secure or not, I feel that we have an ethical commitment to our customers to um, make sure that when they're installing an app, they're not, you know, not putting their whole company at risk by installing them. So that's why we're even here talking about securing the app directory. So sort of a quick recap of the situation from a security point of view of the app directory. Uh, we can't really see what's going on with apps. We're sort of guessing based on behavior. We don't have source, et cetera. Um, the app could be doing a lot of stuff. It could be doing a little bit of stuff inside of Slack and then a bunch of stuff on the back end. It could be doing all kinds of things. And what it's doing could change at any time and we wouldn't know about it, mostly. And um, if something bad happens, people are gonna be mad at us. It's gonna be all our fault. There's a footnote that got cut off there that says like, it's not really our fault, but like, yeah. that's okay. Um, so that's kind of big. That's a, a lot as a security person to feel uh, responsible for, but it's okay because Slack apps are fun. Um, they're very fun. So we're just gonna take a deep breath and talk about how we're gonna fix this situation. So what have we been doing so far to ensure that the apps are secure? Um, if anyone runs a program like this, uh, you might not be super surprised to see our list of steps, which is a lengthy four steps. Um, so Amy's team that I mentioned earlier installs each app that's submitted in a test workspace. Um, they do some functionality testing, making sure that the app actually works. Because like I said, we don't put broken apps in the app directory. Um, and they also do some checking to make sure that any scope that the app requested, it actually uses. Um, so we never want to accept an app that asks for a scope and then just sort of sits on it, uh, doesn't adhere to the principle of least privilege and allows apps to do sketchy things long term, like suck up all of your history, uh, which wouldn't be cool if it ever happened in real life at any company. Um, we also do some automated scanning using two different tools that we wrote in-house. These are really just looking for security low-hanging fruit, like the most basic, easily automatable 
tests, you know, looking for SSL misconfigs on the web apps that back these apps, et cetera. For a very small selection of apps, we do manual pen testing on the product security team. And then this is not actually on the slide, but we've also identified what our riskiest apps are, mostly based on scope, but a couple other things. And we've had those tested by some third-party pen testers. Um, so why is this not enough? It's got four steps in it, which is like kind of a lot, um, but it's not enough. So a bunch of things to consider here. So Slack apps are almost always backed by a web app, as I said, and we don't want to put our clients in a position where we're saying, hey, install this app, and the app itself is fine, the limited functionality in the app is fine, but the web app is just like a flaming pile of security garbage. Um, we, we want to prevent people from running into that. But we can't possibly look at every single backing web app. Uh, that would be a lot of work. The internet is very big. Um, even if we could dedicate that time to doing full testing, apps change. Uh, both the Slack app itself can change, which we have limited visibility into, and that backing web app can change, which we have no visibility into. Um, automated scanning is a little less straightforward than you might hope as we learned after we wrote two different tools for it. Um, we found a lot of what's complicated is not necessarily uh, looking for vulns. We were able to pull a lot of open source packages into our tools and do things like SQLI map, et cetera. Um, that part wasn't super hard. The hardest part of automation actually ended up being installing Slack apps. If you've installed a lot of Slack apps, you may notice there's not a really standard flow there. Um, it really depends on the developer and that makes it super hard to automate. You also don't see a lot of relevant traffic between, um, from the client end of testing, so you can't see like, between the backing web app and the Slack app like, what's happening there. It's very unidirectional, which is a bummer for automation. And last but not least, we don't really have enough time on our team to do this. Uh, we've got five engineers working on a wide range of security concerns, so like, app directory is a tiny piece of the huge pile of work that we do. Um, if that sounds good to anybody, hit me up. I'm hiring, and that is not a joke, uh, so get in touch. Um, that's all the stuff that we've tried so far and why it's not working. We have lots of ideas for other things that we could do. Um, being from a consulting background, I'm like, let's hire some pen testers. That'd be good. Um, we could also ask our developers for any certifications that they have. Um, we could host their apps in our infrastructure something like Heroku for Slack. Um, we could leverage our risk and compliance team to do the reviews for us, which sounds great to me, but they also don't have that many people. Um, we could include apps in our bug bounty programs. Everybody loves a good bug bounty. And we also could just give up, which is the one of these things that would just you know, work in isolation. Um, but as I said earlier, we are not going to give up. We are never going to give up. Um, because we think it would be unethical too. And uh, we can't stop and won't stop, but I will stop talking and I will let Kelly talk again. Cool, so, you know, I'm gonna talk about what we could try in the future. So, pen testing. We can't do pen testing of every app ourselves, but like maybe we can pay other people to do it. But this opens up other questions, like who's gonna pay for it? Is the responsibility on us or is it on those app, direct, app developers? Uh, asking app developers to foot the bill would be really punitive against our smaller third-party friends who write great apps but might just be two people in some mythical garage creating the next big thing. Um, but can we absorb that cost for them? Like, is that sustainable? Also, pen tests are a snapshot of a moment in time. So if we shell out for them, they could change the very next day and we would be back to square one. So can we also require people to repeat testing on a regular schedule or after changes and how do we enforce that and just trust that they're doing it? And just what does a test include anyway? Uh, is it just the Slack app itself or is it the Slack app and the backing web app that the company has? And this is a philosophical question that gets a little bit tricky and sticky. Like, are we, Slack, okay with having an app in our directory that maybe isn't problematic in itself? Like maybe it's fine, but it might encourage or require users to then also use some highly insecure web app that's totally out of our control. Uh, certifications. So how many of you are governance and compliance people? 
Okay, I'm so sorry for what I'm about to say. Uh, do certs actually like mean anything? <laughs> Respect that this person is shaking their head. No. Uh, <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, the certification processes are that someone just asks these developer teams questions and then they answer and then you just believe them. Like, no one is there to look at the code and verify that what they say is happening is actually happening and that they've done it the proper way, that like they actually do what they think they're doing. Like, it's, and no disrespect to developers. I say this because security is really hard. It's easy to mess up. And that's kind of where certifications, like, as former pen testers, we have trouble trusting them. Because even the best intended developers are going to screw things up. Um, certifications, also a snapshot in time. Like, how do we recheck certification? Also, certs cost money. It is so much money to pay those consultants to come in for however long they come in to ask all those questions. Uh, hosting services. So again, as Nikki suggested, we could be like the Heroku of Slack apps and host them. And this would give us a few benefits, like visibility into when things are updated. But it's a huge overhead for Slack. Like taking those computing resources and paying for them, it's a bit much. And maybe by doing that, we would be moving the risk too far into our own arena. OK, so compliance-focused vendor review. So we have this really cool risk and compliance team at Slack that does this thing already of asking developers questions of you know, companies that we partner with at Slack and whose products we use. So could we just like leverage them to perform these compliance vendor reviews? Um, but what questions should they ask? And again, we're just taking their word and believing them. So bug bounty, this is kind of a cool one. Um, we were thinking that if these companies already have an existing bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure program, could they just include their Slack app as part of their bug bounty? But again, that requires some of them to trust Slack and to trust the security of the Slack platform. And be there becomes a liability of like, who owns this risk? Again, like, that's kind of the biggest question in all of this. Um, we could include Slack apps in our bug bounty. Like, is that an option? There, there's a precedent for this with HackerOne's Google Play Store program, where uh, Google and then the developers themselves kind of split the liability on the bug bounty program. That's something that we're looking at, but again, that's like kind of a moonshot. OK, what about a combined risk score? So bear with me here. I recently learned about this system that the DMV in New Jersey has. Let's, let's, let's have tech take a lesson from the DMV in New Jersey. Uh, in order to prove your identity and your address, you have to provide documents that are based on a point system. And so in order to actually get a state ID, you have to have a total of six points. And different documents that you bring carry different weights. So birth certificates, passports, like those, those carry a lot of weight. But they also take things like school IDs, bank statements, utility bills, and other pieces of mail, kind of demonstrating that like, in aggregate with a lot of small things, you actually kind of can prove your identity. So that program allows for some flexibility in what's provided to demonstrate that verification. So if we were to borrow from each of those previous ideas and combine them into an aggregate score, over time we would have riskier apps and less risky apps, like kind of a spectrum, rather than just like good or bad, and it's slightly more nuanced than like safe or scary, because you know everybody knows that like if an app is listed as being scary, like no one's going to actually install it, and if they are, there's someone who doesn't bother reading scopes. So there's this kind of risk of usability that I think Adrian Porter felt has talked about at Google, of like how do you make this legible and accessible to less security savvy users? If they see that lower grade, like are they just going to avoid an app forever and be really freaked out? But on the other hand, like maybe this is a good thing that will enforce better practices. And then on the other, other hand, will this hurt small dev shops? We don't want to penalize them. OK, so this is kind of a weird note to end on. But like, in conclusion, like. There is no conclusion. There is no conclusion. <laughs> We're still working on this. And it's a big conversation that we've been having with a lot of other companies. And without naming names or shaming anyone, like. I can tell you that on the spectrum of security reviews of app directories, like Slack is pretty good. Like we're pretty high up there. Um, and just, you know, we have this fascinating interplay between all of our separate engineering products and we're 
sailing into these new waters, but we don't quite have the safety guidelines fully articulated yet. And we're not alone. So you know, as a lot of us are realizing that our software is much more powerful in tandem, like Voltron, we, we are in this together and we're all working on it. Um, yeah, I think that that's a good place to end. Uh, you know, don't worry, we're gonna figure it out. Like, we're professionals, it's fine. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. And <laughs> thank you from B2. Um, we'll take general questions. Uh, we super want to hear your general questions, but we would also love to hear, as you're all security people who at least a little bit care at Slack, about Slack or you wouldn't be here, um, we would love to hear specifically what people think about an aggregate risk score, if that would mean anything to you as a security person, or if um, you'd still be like, certs are meaningless, don't give people points for this. Um, yeah, cool. Questions, ask that. <laughs> Yeah, sorry to be typing. I'm literally taking notes on what you're saying. What was the last part? Um, yeah, so detection, detection when an app is doing what? Detection when an app starts doing something unexpected. Ah. So that one I can speak to. We actually are working on some stuff with our platform team to detect that. So part of our driving force for like getting our security ducks in a row for an app directory, this is a little awkward to talk about, but I'm just going to dive right in and do it. Um, so Cambridge Analytica was super scary to us um, because that's something that could happen with Slack apps or, or could have happened six months ago with Slack apps and we would not necessarily have known it was happening. Um, it would be totally possible for someone to write an app that would exfil all your data, send it somewhere, um, and we would find out when it was too late. Obviously, everyone at Slack super freaked out by that, don't want it. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is doing detection of when an app's behavior changes. Mm -hmm. um, so like for instance, uh, if we're suddenly seeing a lot of an API call that an app doesn't usually make, like having our incident and response people look into that and be like, what up? Are you suddenly exfiltrating all our data? So yeah, yeah that part we're working on. Um, finer grain scopes I think are gonna come to, uh, we're working on some stuff related to that with platform, but I don't have an ETA on that one. It's a good idea too, though. Um, yeah, and I would add that like our scopes now are pretty fine-tuned, and the messages when you install them are are pretty specific. Like it, the dialogue does explain what scopes you're allowing an app to perform. My concern is like, are people reading that? Do people have workspaces where literally any employee can install any app? And like, do you trust all those employees to be reading those scopes? There's usability concerns there. Oh yeah, I just remembered what the other thing for scopes is called. It's called the permissions API. You can read public doc on it. We had it in developer preview uh, and it's gonna come back. So we developer previewed it. We stopped it for a while to make it more better. The basic idea is that you grant, grant an app scopes permanently, um, but then you can have short-term grants for scopes that the app doesn't need all the time and then the user approves those on an as needed basis versus giving that app that scope for all users in your workspace. Cool. Yeah. Yay. Anyone else? We would love to hear if you work at one of those companies that has an app directory or even as users, like what about a score? What do you think? I'm glad I got one, Ned. Yes, no, <laughs> useful, not useful. Some thumbs up. Us is shaking her head. Yeah, cool. I think, I think we have to yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we do have a kill switch for apps. Um, so sh should someone make a report to us that's like, this app is suddenly, well, okay. So um, the only place we've had to use the kill switch in history that I'm aware of was an app that started uh, suddenly spamming um, not safe for work content. Um, so we do have a kill switch where like if someone reported that, boom, the app would be disabled completely. We'd revoke all the tokens that are out for it in the world. Um, we have that ability. We don't use it often. Um, we're we have a really good incident response team and they look into issues and then decide on a case-to-case -case basis. We've been lucky so far, people haven't done a lot of malicious stuff with Slack apps. Um, but we, we do get things like apps that are suddenly sending alerts 500 times when they're supposed to send an alert once and stuff. And we do investigate those and disable things. We're also fairly aggressive about delisting apps, which is something I only learned recently. I mentioned we had this external um, pen testing firm test some of our riskier apps. Um, during that test, so I had started out with a list of, I think, 45 apps that I wanted them to test. 
Um, but they ended up testing 50 apps and only 35 were from the original set because 10 of those got delisted in that time because um, things changed where like the app broke, it wasn't working anymore, or we del delist also if the contact person stops responding. So like if a complaint comes in about your app and our team reaches out to your contact person and the contact person doesn't talk back to you, whoa, we're gonna disable your app. And we don't like delete it forever. You can come back into the store after that, but we will disable at least temporarily. That was a really long answer. I hope I answered your question though. Yeah. Cool. I love the app directory. I love Slack and Slack apps, and I will go for like a really long time about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, would the, the score consist of permissions as well, or would you want people to evaluate yeah. mm -hmm. permissions and the score? Yeah. yeah, so um, we have an evolving score that we use internally, um, which would probably become part of this public facing score. And one of the inputs into our internal score is the scopes that it requests. So like certain scopes will jump you right to the top of the review list. Uh, like we have admin scope, which literally gives the app the same permissions that an admin in your org has. Uh, those ones get intense scrutiny um, yeah. because so much can go wrong there. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think yeah. there's snacks outside. Yeah, let's go get some snacks. <laughs> Thank you, OWASP folks. Yeah.